is okay. Yeah. And uh, so I want to remind you that tomorrow has a Tuesday schedule. So no, tomorrow has a Thursday schedule, which probably makes no difference for you because you don't have Tuesday, Thursday registration. So what? But maybe for your other classes. Um, there, I want to remind you also that there's still a web assignment that's due on Wednesday or Tuesday night if you want. Um, and I will put up another one probably tomorrow that will be short, that will be due the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. So it will be short because it's uh, short. Um, any other announcements I need to make? I don't think so. I don't know. Okay, so uh, what we were doing last time. Okay, so we're doing differential equations. And um, in particular, last time, I mean, we had talked about uh, direction fields and Euler's method and ways of approximating solutions. <coughs> Okay, and last time we talked about one technique for solving certain kinds of differential equations, which was separable ones. Um, which is a relatively straightforward technique, which says that if we have equation of the form dy dx is some function of x over some function of y, which obviously it doesn't need to be over, it can be a product. So if you can sort of separate the x's from the y's, then you rewrite it by putting the y's on one side and integrating and putting the x's on the other side and integrating. And then that just gives you a function g of y to sum f of y plus c and then you sum. Assuming you care. Right, so for separable equations, this is pretty straightforward. Um, we did a few examples of this last time. Uh, maybe the simplest separable, separable equation so, so a lot of models that come up in a lot of applications are separable not all of them but a lot of them are so and so the simplest one is the exponential one. Say I have, doesn't matter what letter I use, dy dx equals 3y. So here, the f of x is just 1. And g of y is 1 over 3y. So we can separate to write this as 3y I could leave the 3 over there just to have something. y dy equals 3 dx. And then you integrate both sides. Wait, isn't it uh, y over uh, y, yeah, dy, dy over y. y. Thank you. So then I, did I do this already last time? Um, Maybe not. It doesn't matter. So I integrate both sides. And I get the log of y is 3x plus a constant. So to solve this for y, I can exponentiate both sides to get, so e to the log of y is the absolute y, and then this is e to the 3x plus some constant, which e to the 3x plus a constant is e to the 3x times e to the c. <coughs> and 
and since c is just some arbitrary number, then e to the c is some arbitrary number. Uh, and so I have, I guess I'll just continue it here. I have the absolute value of y is some number e to the 3x, but that means that y is plus or minus some number e to the 3x. Now, there's something here that I left off. I mean, it, it came back. It came back in some subtle way. But you see, when I, when I was here, I'm missing a solution. What solution is it? So if I, if I just say that y equals e to some constant times e to the 3x. This is not wrong, except that there's one solution that I'm missing that doesn't satisfy this formula. The C. What? The C. The C? Well, the C is obscuring some certain fact here. So here, if you pick any C, e to the C is a positive number. So I've called this A. And A has to be positive. But I have an absolute value of Y, so that means I pick up the negative ones too. But what if, what, what about the zero solution? The zero work here. Suppose I give you the initial condition for this, that I have this equation, and I say that, I say that at time zero, I've got nothing. Then what value of c works for this? None of them. Right? There's no value of c that will make this work at minus infinity, but minus infinity is not much of a number. Yet, somehow magically, when I did this manipulation, uh, let's call it B, it came back because I can take B equals zero. That doesn't always happen. What went wrong? Where did this zero solution go? It somehow got lost during my manipulations. How did it get lost? Everything I did was algebraically fine and not making any algebra mistakes, unusual for me. Yeah. So you think it, it went here? Okay, so that is a good guess. It's not quite right. It's related to that. It actually happened before this. So think about what I'm saying. What if y of 0 is 0? Or y of 5 is 0, yeah. Well, it actually happened before that. It's when I divided by y. You can't divide by 0. Oops. So, so sometimes you have to pay attention that right here, I'm assuming to go from here to here, I'm assuming that y is uh, not equal to 0. Because if y is equal to 0, this is nonsense. 1 over y equals 3? Yeah. If y was equal to 0, we wouldn't have had to do that anyway. If y equals 0, we don't have anything to do anyway. The derivative is 0. So the derivative is 0. So the function is a constant. We're done. But, so I didn't have to worry about y equals 0. 
But here I assumed y was 0, and then went merrily along and found all of the solutions except this one. So you have to think about what you're doing because sometimes you'll make assumptions that will rule out solutions that might be just the ones you're looking for. You have to think about, oh, I made an assumption that y is not 0 so I can divide by it. But if y is 0, the problem is really easy anyway. So we have to pay attention to certain little cases. <coughs> so I guess what I'm saying is, you know, don't, don't get too carried away with the formulaic manipulations. And here we're lucky because the form of the solution that we come up with allows us to take the constant equals 0 anyway. So the zero solution sort of magically comes back. But it doesn't always do that. And similarly, sometimes when you're doing it, you have to make a choice. Oh, let's assume this is a positive number, because you have a square root floating around or something like that. And if it's negative, you get different answers. So sometimes you just have to pay attention to what you're doing. And when you get to the end, you have to say, did that make sense? Okay? All right. So, uh, I don't know why I wanted to point that out now, but I did. Okay. So, these separable equations are, in general, pretty easy. Um, they come down to just doing some integrals. Let me do another. So, there's a bunch of applications that are standard for these kinds of differential equations. Um, one of them, well, I guess I did one before. Let me, let me do that one again. So there's one I did but for Euler's method. I don't know, should I do the same? Let me do the same one. So I had uh, a block of clay that I put in a kiln or whatever. Was that Friday or Wednesday? Sometime last week I had a heating problem. Does anybody want to see that one? I can solve it explicitly. Now. Yeah, go ahead. You want to see me solve it explicitly? Okay. So we have, so we're heating a block of junk in a kiln. Kiln has an L in it, I guess. And it starts at 50 degrees. Fahrenheit and the kiln is at 500 degrees Fahrenheit and after what, one hour? The temperature is what, 100? Is that what I did last time? I think so. 100 degrees. So now what's the temperature at six hours? Or maybe, I guess I did four. Okay? And we use, the, we use the fact of Newton's law of cooling, or Newton's law of heating, or whatever you want to call it, which says that the rate of change, so, So Newton's law of cooling says that, so let's let T of, I guess, H, so let's let H be the hours, T of H be the temperature of the, of the clay. Well, it won't be clay once it gets to that temperature, but of the stuff. And Newton's law of cooling says that the rate of change in the temperature of the stuff is proportional to the difference between the current temperature and the ambient temperature. Right? I have my kiln and I have my stuff in it and it's hot here and this is cooler and the rate of change of the temperature of the cool stuff, this is uh, 500 degrees and this is less than 500. So this will want to heat up. 
And so it says that the rate of change in the temperature of the stuff is proportional to, which means it's a constant times, the difference in the current temperature and the ambient temperature. So that's our differential equation. This applies to not just heating things, but also to cooling things. If I take, uh, when I take the clay out of the oven and I set it down so it's now a, a, a beautiful bowl, so when I take my, my ceramic sculpture out of the oven and I set it to cool in a 70 degree room, the rate at which it will cool will be proportional to the temperature that it is when it comes out of the oven, the difference between that and the, the air around it. Okay. So, how do we solve this? Well, we try and write it as a separable equation. Oh, I guess this has the initial condition that t of 0 is 50. And we also know that t of 1 is something. Uh, right? So that's, once we have this, this is the whole problem written without words. Well, except find t of 4. So we have dt dh equals constant. I'm going to drop the of h's. T minus 500. And so I can separate this equation and write it as dt over t minus 500 equals a constant dh. And then I can just integrate. Well, OK, so I can just do this. Yeah. It's exactly the same equation. It's just that t of 0 will be, say, 95. And this will be, say, 20. It's exactly the same equation. It's just, you know, the k will be different. In this case, the k will be negative. In the cooling case, the k will, the k will be positive. I think so. One or the other. But it's the same. Yeah. Um, you said the k is a constant, right? Yes. Okay. I have to figure it out. Right? So I have to use this information to figure out what k is. Uh, yeah. So I can do this, or I could also make a substitution if I want and turn it into an equation I already know. So, well, let's do this, and then I'll, I'll do both of those. And so, so if I integrate this, I get the log of t minus 500 equals kt plus some other constant. So now I have two constants. And so that means that exponentiating, so again, this is assuming that t minus t is not 500. Because if t is 500, what I did is just wrong. But if t is 500, it stays 500, so we're okay. Yeah. Uh, because I can't write. Thank you. So, so that means that t minus 500 is, well, e to the c is some constant a, e to the kh. And so that means that this is really, remember, t of h. That means that t is 500. Uh, what's looking for on here? Oh, well. Plus a e to the kh. And so now I have a formula for the temperature. But there are two constants here I don't know. I don't know a, and I don't know k. But a is easy to find. Because I know t is 0. So to find a, so I know that 50 is t of 0 is 
500 plus a e to the 0. So a is 450. Right? Just subtract plus 12. Right? 50 is 500 plus a. Negative 450. Yes. Uh, okay, so we have that. And now we can find K. So here I have, uh, I've lost track. I have T of H is 500 minus 450 e to the k h. And so when h is 1, that's 100. And that's 500 minus 450 e to the, eight, uh, e to the k. So that means minus 400 equals minus 450 k. So 400 over 450, which is 40 over 45, I'll write that one, which is 8 over 9. I think so. Is K, so that means K is the log. K is the log of eight months. Right? Think so? Yes. Okay, so that means that T of H is now 500 <laughs> minus 450 E to the log of 8 ninths of h. So then to figure out what t of, pick your favorite number is, you just plug it. Right? If you want, you know, this is, this is a log of 8 ninths is a negative number, and you can manipulate it a little more, but this is good for me. So, so I can't calculate it right now. It's uh, so I think last time we got something like 260 something. I need to do it with a calculator to see what it is. Okay. Now, really, this is just an exponential growth problem, or exponent. I mean, this is this problem is really the same as this problem. The only difference here, instead of going through this business and solving the equation I already solved once, I could just make the substitution u equals t minus 500, or how about let's call it x, because I called it x there. y. y equals t minus 500, and that would transform, so let me just point that out. So if I let y equals t minus 500, then dy dt dh is the same as dt dh. And so this equation just becomes, so dt dh equals k t minus 500 becomes the same as dy dh equals kh, which we already know the solution to, without having to solve. Uh, y equals some constant e to the k1. 
So a lot of times, by making the substitution, you can transform one variable into another, but you have to remember that your substitution also changes the derivative. Right? So we have to remember to substitute not only for the variable, but also for the derivative. And, you know, it's the same. They're really the same problem exactly. Um, okay. Any questions on that at all? No. Okay, good. So, these exponential... So, I, I think someone... I don't know, they posted on Piazza or something once that they, they want to understand why E shows up all over the place. This is why. Almost all differential equations, not almost all, many differential equations, a lot of differential equations, somehow show up to say the derivative of a thing has some relation to its value. So exponential growth, exponential decay, uh, heating, cooling, a lot of these things have exponentials hiding in them. And as we saw when we played with power series, sines and cosines, are really exponentials in disguise, um, right? Because and also uh, in the paper homework that was due last week, another family of things called uh, hyperbolic sine and cosine are just sums of exponentials again in some little disguise. So a lot of things exponentials show up in. Another typical class of applications that show up in these introductory differential equations are mixing type problems. These are, oh, actually, let me stick to exponentials for just a minute, and then I'll come back. These exponential problems, they model lots of things. Right? They model population growth in many cases. They model uh, compound interest. They model uh, motion of a, you know, you have, you have a, 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 a door on a spring. Then when you shut the door, there's an exponential involved. There's a whole ton of things. So, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like in the back, when you close the door, and there's that damper to keep it from slamming, that damper causes it to slow down with an exponential speed. So this exponential stuff shows up in lots of applications. Um, another standard application would be a mission kind of problem. So this, let me just say, this short homework that's going to be due next week, there'll be a bunch of application-y kinds of things on it. Uh, so you have, say, some tank that's filled with, so I might as well just steal this problem here, uh, 200 kilograms of salt in 5,000 meters of water. So I have some salty water. So I have 200, 200 or 20? I said 20. Okay, so 20 kilograms of salt in 500 liters of water. So I have a tank here full of some salty water. If you don't want it to be salt and you don't want it to be water, it doesn't matter. You can have it be anything you like. Um, and so what we're going to do here is we're going to drain some off and we're going to fill it up with some other stuff. So some comes in and some goes out. And there's a big stirrer in here. So we're going to assume that the stuff is always staying stirred. And 
Um, three kilograms of salt per liter. So what comes in, so add a mixture with three kilograms, no, 0.03. And we're going to take some out at 25, so it comes in at 25 liters per minute. So what both, so it comes in at 25 and out at 25. Okay, so the rate in and the rate out is the same. And that way it doesn't overflow and it doesn't go empty. And so now what is the concentration at some time? So here's the setup. I have some salty water in a tank. I give you an initial concentration. I'm pouring some stuff in, and I'm taking stuff out at the same rate. And I want to know how I can describe the concentration. So how would I do this? Yeah? Can you do a differential equation? I would do a differential equation. That's a good start. So. What differential equation would I do? The right one. Over dx equals something. Okay, so, so when you're doing these problems, if you think back to when you had these word problems in calculus or the word problems in uh, algebra or the word problems in whatever, you have to think about what your variables are. So what is it that we want to describe? <clears throat> The concentration. So maybe that should be some variable that we want. This is a function. What does it depend on? Time. So we have to set up our variables. CFT. What do we know about? Yeah. Okay, so we know C of zero uh, is whatever twenty over five hundred kilograms. And we want C of T I guess I already wrote that So I don't need to write it again Okay And we know something else um, C prime of T Well, okay, so how, how do we figure out C prime of T? Well, we already know it We do? Yeah Where? 25 meters per minute. Well, that's not how much the concentration. So this is the concentration in the tank. Oh my. And there's stuff coming in at 25 liters per minute. And there's stuff going out at whatever rate it is. This is 25 liters per minute of something with three kilograms per liter. So in fact, this is a little bit misleading. We don't really, it's not easy to write, so, to actually think about it in terms of the concentration. Because, 
the amount in the tank is different from the amount in coming in and going out, and they're different units. Instead, let's just think about how much salt we're adding. Right? Well, so, so if we just think about the amount of salt in the tank rather than the concentration, we can get the concentration very easily by dividing the amount of salt in the tank by 500. So C is in some sense not the natural variable that we want. It's okay, it just makes life a lot more complicated. It would be much easier to just forget about concentrations and think about amount of salt. Because then, the amount of salt in the tank, divided by how much there is, well, you have how much you start with, and the rate of change of salt is how much you put in, minus how much you take out. And that's very easy. We could rephrase it in terms of C, but let's just phrase it in terms of salt. <laughs> so really our differential equation, let's let S of T equal the amount of salt in the tank. And then the differential equation becomes easy. This is the amount in, or actually the rate. Minus the rate out. It's not a fraction. We put in salt, we take salt out. The water is just uh, the stuff you're carrying the salt with. I mean, if you would prefer to rephrase this in terms of, you know, something else, more, well, it doesn't matter. The water is just the carrier of the salt. And so now we have an easy differential equation. At what rate does the salt come in? How much salt comes in per minute? Well, we're adding 0.3 kilograms per liter at 25 liters per minute. Why did it be 0.3? Should have been 24 liters per minute, and then I can multiply. Oh well. So this is 0.75, right? So our rate in is 0.03 kilograms per liter at 25 liters per minute. So that means I'm adding 0.75 kilograms of salt per minute. And I'm going to take away, well, what am I taking away? I'm taking away I've lost it. Uh, somewhere, it's, oh, the same rate. Right, I'm taking away some stuff at 25 liters per minute. What? How much salt is in the stuff? What? No. I wait an hour and a half. How much salt is in the stuff? I don't know. But what do I know that tells me how much salt there is? There's a variable that I wrote down. It's, it's the concentration, right. Well, what's the concentration? The concentration is the amount of salt divided by 500. So I have some amount of salt, S, in the tank at any given moment. And so its concentration is S over 500. Now, if you, you know, if you want, you can write this in terms of the concentration, but it's sort of a little more natural to think of this in terms of 
the amount of stuff, at least to me. So now we have a relatively straightforward. So this is S of T is in kilograms, and this is in liters, so the units all work. Right, I have kilograms per liter, and liters per minute is kilograms per minute. Kilograms per minute. DS dt, it's the rate of change of salt. So that's kilograms per minute. So the units are all good. We can forget about them now because they all match. So I have DS dt is 0.75 minus uh, 25 over 500 is 50 over 1,000, which is 0.05. Right? Think so. Well, this is the differential equation we just did. Right? Once again, some number minus some number times s. It's really the same as this differential equation. It's some exponential that's shifted. But we can just do it again if you want. Uh, yeah. Oh, and I guess we have the initial s of 0 is uh, 20, no, 40. Wait. Uh, S is the amount in the tank. Yeah, S is the amount in the tank. Right. So S of 0 is 20. So there's the differential equation. Does anyone want me to complete this, or is everyone confident they can do this? Is there anyone who's not confident they can do this? Okay, since you're all confident you can do it, I won't do it. Um, okay, so. Now, there's a little bit... So, you know, I can go through 20 different applications that all turn out to be some separable equation, integrate both sides, blah, 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 blah. Let me not do that. You can read about several more in the book. You, can, you will get to do several more on homework. Um, so, the other, so then there's a, we have to talk a little bit about exponential growth. which I think everybody has seen a jillion times before, but I have to say a few words about it. So exponential growth or decay, the standard applications that this models are population growth with no constraints, um, so here, so this is a differential equation like, I just did it, dy, d, let's put a t, so we think of it as model in time, dy dt is some constant times y, which gives us that y equals a, e, and k, t. So in population growth here, k is usually positive, this is the growth rate, and a is the initial population. Uh, so also decay of some radioactive particle like uranium or something like that. There's a half-life. K is dependent on the half-life. Um, so here our constant is negative. Um, Compound interest. You invest some money that's compounded continuously. Again, this is an exponential growth problem. And as we saw, sort of a slight variation is heating, cooling, and sort of mixing. These things, 
they're not strictly exponentials, they're exponentials from a constant. Right? So the, the distinction among between these guys and these guys is just what you call zero, or what you call your baseline. If we look at If we look at the slope field and the direction field for an exponential guy, well, we have the zero solution here, and then we see things like this. This is the direction field where k is positive. And so you make some, you have some initial population, or you make an initial investment, and then it grows exponentially. Or if k is negative, then these things, what am I doing? I don't know. These things look like this instead. And you make your initial, you have your initial amount of uranium or whatever it is, and it decays exponentially like that. Right? So this is k less than zero. And then these mixing problems, or cooling, or whatever, they just shift this picture up. So in that heating the block of clay, this is 500. And we have a picture that looks like we made the direction field. looks something like this, and we have, we put it in the oven, and we heat it, and it tends towards 500. Or in the cooling problem, you take it out of the oven, and you cool it, and it tends toward the equilibrium solution. These are all the same thing. And solving these problems analytically always comes down to, well, you don't necessarily have to separate variables. So for example, I bet you did these problems in high school, and when you did them in high school, you just had this formula. You didn't have a differential equation, but you had this formula. And you probably also did them in calculus one, which was what you did in high school. And again, you kind of had this differential equation, but you did a lot of proofing around, and then it came out. Um, but they're really all the same thing, and they all come down to fiddling with the constants and away you go. Now, in practice, a lot of times you have some kind of an experiment, and you have some data which may grow exponentially, or you believe is some kind of exponential model. So you have some data which fits some sort of what you believe to be exponential line, and then you try and fit a curve of this type to it. And I just want to point out, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, because I think you've all done this before. If you just choose two points and fit a curve, it doesn't always fit so well. It's the same problem. If you have linear data, you always have some kind of noise. So you can do some kind of a least square thing, or you can just eyeball it and make a guess. Does everybody know what I'm talking about here? Am I saying anything new? I can't tell whether you guys are paying attention. You guys are paying Or at least you're pretending to. Um, so, you know, I don't want to beat this dead horse. I feel like this just goes on and on and on about the same stuff. So rather than just going on and on and on about the same stuff, I will assign some problems along this line. You'll do them, we'll make sure you can do them, and we'll move on. So I think exponential growth is Anyway, because it's easy. So have a nice Thanksgiving. Remember to do paper homework eight, that's critical. That's the second.